This video is sponsored by Surfshark. If modern magazines would have existed back in the 14th century, Ibn Battuta might have made it on the cover of a special edition as the most interesting man in the world. He started his travels from Morocco only with his donkey, and in the next 30 years or so covered more than 75,000 miles and visited more than 40 modern countries. His travels took him to many different parts of the world, from the gorgeous architecture of Damascus, the Holy Land of Mecca, the steppes of Asia, and the banks of the river Yamuna in Delhi, to eventually arriving in China. In a time when the concept of traveling was exclusively related to pilgrimage and trade, Ibn Battuta dared to desire distant lands to explore. His adventures were not only memorable, but also perilous as he came close so many times to his own demise. But they were also romantic as he met and bedded many women. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we're going to learn about a day in the life of the famous Moroccan explorer, Ibn Battuta. Born in Tangier, Morocco, Shams al-Din Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Abdallah Ibn Muhammad Ibn Ibrahim Ibn Battuta al-Lawadi al-Tanji, or Ibn Battuta for short, belonged to a family of fairly well-off Muslim legal scholars. Ibn Battuta himself received an education in Islamic law and was meant to go for a Hajj at the age of 21, the holy pilgrimage to Mecca. Starting alone on a donkey, Batuta would connect with a caravan of other pilgrims working its way across North Africa toward the Holy Land. From Tripoli, the caravan proceeded without trouble across Libya to the eastern edge of the Maghrib. Ibn Batuta completed the 2,000-mile trip across the Maghrib in around eight or nine months. If someone was making such a journey today, they would have issues with streaming content that they love to watch due to geolocation restrictions. But we also have something that Ibn Battuta didn't have back then, Surfshark VPN. With Surfshark VPN, you can swap the real location of your device with a new one or have one location set for no matter where you are in the world and enjoy streaming content of your choice. Not only that, Surfshark VPN also keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet. This keeps your personal data protected from big companies or cyber criminals. But if you're wondering, what if Surfshark is keeping an eye on what you do while using their VPN? Don't worry, because Surfshark neither monitors, tracks, or stores what you do online. This is how we accumulate hidden nutty records of history to retell them to you. Thank you, Surfshark, for keeping us safe. If you want to use the internet smartly, like us, you can get Surfshark by using the link down below using Nutty Deal to get 83% off your first three months of subscription and get three extra months for free. They also offer a 30-day money-back guarantee to let you try their services without a sweat. The link is in the description below. Batuta was welcomed warmly in Tuglok's court thanks to the gifts he borrowed from an Iraqi merchant, a horde of 30 horses, camels, arrows, and servants. In return, Tuglok rewarded his manners, qualification, and knowledge with the position of chief Qadi or chief judge with a signing on bonus of 12,000 dinars and a matching figure for his annual salary. Batuta was rich. At that time, an average North Indian family lived on about 5 to 10 dinars a month. Tuglog, despite being a bright administrator, was also quite an eccentric, erratic, and cruel ruler. Even by Middle Ages standards, Tuglog had no chill. Criminals were flayed or thrown into elephant pens who had tusk-mounted swords. Hundreds were brought in chains daily to the audience hall to be put to death, punished, or worse. At one point, Ibn Battuta himself was suspected of disloyalty and was forced to abandon his possessions, wear beggar's rags, and live with a hermit in a cave for five months until things calmed down. Batuta returned to Tuglok's court when summoned, but he was fearful for his life now. Before being exiled, he had witnessed how brutally Tuglok had dealt with rebels and Batuta knew if he stayed longer, his number would be up. So he tried to take a leave with the excuse of making another Hajj trip. To his surprise, the Sultan had very different plans for him. Given that Batuta had been around a lot, Sultan Tuglog offered him to be Delhi's ambassador to China. Batuta was more than happy to agree despite the dangerous nature of the journey and agreed to carry shiploads of gifts to the Mongol emperor along with 15 messengers making their way back home. Gifts from Muhammad Tuglog to the Mongol emperor included 200 Hindu servants, singers and dancers, 100 horses, and great amounts of cloth, dishes and swords. There were about 1,000 soldiers under his command to protect the treasure and supplies until they could board ships to China. To Batuta's misfortune, the journey didn't have the best of beginnings. 4,000 Hindu rebels were waiting for him just outside Delhi. 
Despite being outnumbered, Batuta claimed that they survived the first wave, but the next ambush separated him from his companions. He was robbed of everything, except for his clothes and cloak, and barely made it through alive after being imprisoned for a night. Somehow, by a stroke of luck, Batuta found the convoy again, and they sailed south. At Calicut, Batuta met some Chinese ships which were able to carry more than a thousand crew and passengers. Batuta and his convoy boarded these ships in hopes of an easy journey, but fate had a storm waiting for them. The ships broke down at the shore, and Batuta helplessly witnessed more of the treasures, horses, and servants drown, making matters worse, as if the only surviving ship with Batuta's luggage and servants, the one carrying Batuta's child, left him behind. Afraid to return to Tuglag, Batuta chose to take a detour through the Maldives and Sri Lanka to reach China. The Sultan of Maldives offered him a post of high judge, and Batuta couldn't deny it. The man took four more wives and rode the city roads on horseback like a king, which earned him envious enemies. When things got heated, he divorced all of his new wives and left for Sri Lanka. But his bad luck continued. Leaving Sri Lanka for China, the traveler was robbed again by pirates. It took him another attempt and 40 days of journey to finally arrive at the seaport of Chanzhou on the coast of Fujian province. Surprised to see even beggars and monks wearing silk, he was astonished by their pottery and more shocked by their customs. The rest of his journey in China is described vaguely, but he spent nine months there before he got homesick. On his way back to Tangier, Batuta learned the fates of his many wives, but three years later he was retired in Tangiers, telling grand tales of his travels. He decided to extend his itinerary further to include Persia and Iraq in his travels before returning to Mecca once more. The intrigue to learn more about Sufism led him to Basra, Isfahan, and Baghdad. I'm sure you're probably wondering, how the heck was he financing such lavish travels? In those days, charity had a very high value in Islam. Islamic rulers and aristocrats were often judged and remembered by their charity just as much as by their power or policy. Ibn Battuta visited these people and told them of the courts and other kingdoms, offered his counsel, and entertained them with his stories and learning. Nearly everyone he met in this capacity, no matter how humble, offered him gifts in return. But Baghdad's Ilkhan Abu Sayyid and Battuta formed a special friendship. Battuta and Ilkhan were nearly the same age, and Battuta described him as God's most beautiful creature, and he was impressed by the region's musical prowess and wisdom. In a year, he traveled more than 4,000 miles and crossed mountains and deserts alike. After his first naval expedition to East Africa, Batuta returned to Mecca for his third Hajj, and visiting India was a priority on his mind. Not only did he want to meet the Sufi saints, but he was ambitious to work for the Sultan of Muslim-controlled India. In November 1331, Ibn Batuta sailed on the Black Sea, but the guide intentionally misled him to extort money. Wow, they did that back then too, huh? However, things got better for Batuta after catching up to the caravan of Azbek Khan, a descendant of Genghis Khan. Azbek was then the ruler of the Golden Horde, and his caravan was no less than a city on wheels. Batuta wore three fur coats, two pairs of trousers, two pairs of heavy socks, and heavy boots lined with bear skin. Whenever he washed with hot water, the water would run down his beard and freeze. For five months, he traveled through the lands that had suffered the worst of a Mongol offensive and it was nearly impossible to find any signs of remaining civilization. Do you think you would have survived traveling the world in the 14th century? Tell us in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.